Kaduna State Governor Malam Nasil El Rafai yesterday clarified the position of Northern governors over the power shift controversy. The Northwest governor stated that his colleagues in the North never opposed the presidency going to the South in 2023, but were only against the language used by their Southern colleagues. He said the word must which was at variance with democracy and characterized by negotiations and horse trading by parties involved, often out of public glare. However, in their earlier reaction to the NGF communique, the Southern and Middle Belt Alliance, Samba, described as inflammatory the resolution of Northern Governors Forum, NGF, over power rotation, saying such statement was capable of fueling secessionist agitations in the country. Dr. Abati, this has been going back and forth and been brewing for quite a while. Well, I think that uh, this is an important development. Mm. What we're not sure of is whether Nasir Rufai is speaking for himself in his own personal capacity, or he's providing information, mm. or he's reflecting the new thinking mm. of the uh, Northern uh, Governors Forum. He not being either a spokesperson for that forum or the chairperson of that forum. But if what he has said uh, is a reflection of the new thinking, the new orientation, or an attempt to clarify uh, the exact position that was taken by the Northern Governors Forum, then I think it's very helpful. Because when the Northern Governors Forum, along with traditional rulers from the North, reacted to the resolution of the Southern Governors uh, that uh, power must uh, rotate, uh, must shift to the South in 2023, uh, uh, we had uh, sounded a note of caution about favorite rhetoric, the type that could further deepen the divisions in the country. And the reaction was immediate from various groups in the South, from Oanez Indigo, from the uh, Southern Middle Belt uh, uh, Forum, from other groups, from Afeniferi, from even Nigerians in the diaspora. That, you know, pushback uh, may have accounted for this attempt uh, to provide the necessary clarification, not just by uh, Governor Nasir Arufai, but also Dr. Akim Baba Ahmed, who in the introduction reportedly issued a statement to say that, look, the best way forward is for Nigerians to have a conversation. If there's going to be a power shift, okay, fine. But there could be, you know, negotiations, there could be conversations. And Erufai was saying specifically that what Northern leaders object to is the word must. And I thought that on, our, on this program previously, I thought Dr. Akim Baba Ahmed made a similar point mm -hmm. that look, what uh, the North is objecting to is the arrogance of uh, Southern stakeholders who are dictating to them within a democratic contest that, you know, something must happen, you know, whether Northerners like it or not. I, I think it was very clear on that score. So, okay, there is opportunity now for a conversation. But if you look at uh, the position of Samba in this day newspaper today, uh, as reported on page 42 of the newspaper, Samba is saying that, well, everybody, that's the Southern uh, Middle Belt uh, Association, Everybody should be reminded of the fact that, look, there's also, it may not be written into the Constitution, as another uh, governor's forum, uh, you know, uh, argued mm. with regard to power rotation. But as Section 14, Subsection 3 of the uh, Constitution, you know, talks about balancing, mm. unity, mm. federal character, equity, mm. justice. So when you look at Chapter 2 of the Constitution, where you find Section 14 and Section 15, Subsection 4, may be non-justiciable, but there are fundamental directives of, of state policy, which are also of interest in terms of how Nigerians uh, relate with one another. Although there is a case in which, you know, uh, it's been decided that in fact you can, you can make a chapter two justiciable, but that's legalese. So the point is, people are talking about equity. They're talking about justice. Mm. They're talking about a sense of belonging. They're talking about a sense of coll collective ownership. And I hope that the leaders, North and South, will, you know, are on the basis of those premises, look for an opportunity to have a conversation, a dialogue, you know, across the Niger, and see that 2023, uh, you know, presidency does not become something that is divisive. And there's enough evidence out there uh, that, uh, look, there is a sense of rotation. You can't take a governor and a deputy governor, as uh, Atedo Peter said, argue, from the same local government. That's true. And you will expect that there will be peace in that particular state. We have even reached a stage in Nigeria now. It's not written into the constitution, but it is the case that when you are choosing uh, uh, partners, deputy and uh, principal, you choose maybe a Muslim and a Christian. Mm -hmm. Although once upon a time in this country, a Muslim, Muslim ticket worked. Mm -hmm. but 
the uh, lines of division are further widened. I don't know whether that will still be possible today. So dialogue, reason, rather than you know, uh, uh, negative rhetoric. Mm. A great, great one, a great, great insight there. And like you said, at this point in time, reason should prevail because that is what we really need. We're divided enough, we're polarized enough, and rhetorics like this just heat up the polity. But most importantly, like uh, a question I always ask is, in all of this conversation, power must shift here. We're not really addressing the issues that matter. The issue of poverty and what is the need for the people. Because all this conversation about political shift here and there, rotational presidency, which is germane also, is about the elites themselves and the politicians. They'll be the ones to benefit. But the niggling problem that niggle 200 million Nigerians, problem of poverty, access to good health care, good roads to drive on, to carry their farm produce to the town, portable water to drink, the fact that they don't even complete primary school again, the fact that the insecurity has made a lot of people in their own country live in IDP camps. We don't hear a lot of enunciation on those issues. And take, for instance, where the northern governors did seat. The fact that 51 people were killed in Zango Kataf was not on the front burner. The fact that most parts of this country have become a killing field is not always on the front burner. And those are the issues that really concern the people more than anything in this our national conversation, because that's only what the people can hold on to. The political elite will hold on to the power. Yes. I mean, we all know how politics is structured in this country. A man out of the rubble, if you don't have at least five or 10 billion, and I cannot say you want to vie for presidency. Mm -hmm. You must have that money to be able to have that political strength. So somebody in the mass population might not have that strength. It's still the elite. But yeah. what comes to the people, Dr. Abati? Well, I think at the end of the day, what is important, the minimum that we can ask for, is that the votes of the people should be made to count. Very good. There should be greater emphasis on electoral integrity mm. as part of the attempt to construct the legacy of the Buhari administration. I imagine that even with all this talk about rotation of power and all of that, that there will be political parties that will make their own choices. Mm. Maybe they may not be as strong as the two leading political parties, the PDP and the APC, but I imagine that there will be a political party that will pick its candidate from the north, another one that will pick from the middle belt. But if the people are empowered and they understand the issues and they've been placed in a position where they can make informed choice, mm. you never know. The electorate may just say, okay, we're even tired of this north-south divide. Why don't we just pick somebody uh, from the middle belt? But okay, maybe that may not happen because of the level of the politics we play. But we should be able to get to that stage in this country, whereby it's the people's choice yes. that is the overriding consideration and not a selfish, narrow, ethnic, religious, primordial interest uh, of persons who go about with a fanciful title of the elites of Nigeria, yeah. uh, who are just committed to, uh, to their own self-interest. Thank you so much for that. That's all on News Headline. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have Rotus Adiri, Michael Wilson, Adesua Morua, Aaron Akerjala to give updates on Africa, global business, COVID-19, and sporting activities across the globe. Stay with us. All right, welcome back to the morning show right here on the Rise News Channel. Uh, before we go over to Rotus Adiri, leading luxury global brand, Mont Blanc, in association with partner Polo Luxury Group, have opened the first standalone outlet for its Nigerian clientele. Arise business correspondent Abi Owolawi was there to share this report. It was a melting pot of luxury aficionados and discerning consumers as luxury maison Mont Blanc launched its first standalone boutique in Nigeria, together with its long standing partner, Polo Luxury, on Wednesday. For both parties, this milestone, a culmination of three decades of partnership, is indeed momentous for the Nigerian luxury retail space. Our relationship with Momblong goes a long way, a few decades in fact. And it has been fostered by mutual trust, mutual respect, that we share common values, a way of working that celebrates high craftsmanship and providing the consumer with 
amazing service and support. With this approach established, who is the Mont Blanc consumer? For the man who is discerning, who has an image of himself, and he wants to complement that image with the things he owns, his possessions, to reflect who he is and his essential character, that is the customer. Now, with a standalone boutique, we put Lagos in the map of a Mont Blanc worldwide network of boutiques. And now we want to ensure that we bring, at the same time than Paris, New York, or Dubai, we can bring the novelties at the same time. As the brand opens its offerings to the Nigerian market, what does this represent for the industry and consumer at large? It shows the might of the brand Mont Blanc. After 20 odd years of working with them, we're culminating that with this boutique. On the polo side, this is a testament of our strength as a brand and our role in the development of the retail landscape in Nigeria. I mean, we have so many more exciting developments coming up and we're looking forward to the future and to continue to offer the sophisticated Nigerian clientele products that they can find anywhere else in the world. Lots of uh, Nigerians are very swamp. And uh, I personally, you know, I'm also a collector and I have two of uh, Mont Blancs myself. So it's something that I think that uh, for a successful Nigerian, you know, everyone who has got a discerning eye, you know, you should identify with uh, Mont Blanc. Abby Owolawi for Arise News. All right, thank you so much, Abby, for that report there on Mont Blanc. Uh, now, uh, the Pernambuco Roads of Dury is here to give us Africa Business Update. Over to you, Rotos. Good morning, Rufai. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning yeah. to all our viewers. We kick off with the Corporate Affairs uh, Commission of, uh, of Nigeria. They say they've completed the in incorporation of NNPC Limited, the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited. This, of course, is in line with the provisions of the Petroleum Industry Act. President Buhari, in his capacity not only as president, but also as Minister of Petroleum, in consultation with the Minister of Finance, uh, um, uh, what is it, Section 53, subsection one or subsection three, I believe, of the Petroleum Industry Act uh, calls for the incorporation, uh, incorporation of the uh, state oil company within uh, six months of the Petroleum Industry Act uh, being signed. So uh, they've moved along pretty quickly in that regard. And the Corporate Affairs Commission confirmed this yesterday uh, that that has now been completed. Now, for investors who are looking forward to the NNPC being listed on uh, the NGX, that's, you know, Mela Kiara has already said, you know, that's not an immediate um, uh, issue right now. That probably won't happen until 2024, 2025. But for now, NNPC you know, is uh, officially uh, incorporated. Um, another development from the um, Federal Executive Council yesterday. Um, paternity leave has been uh, approved for public sector uh, workers. This is part of the new public sector rules. Um, and this was, uh, this was disclosed by uh, Falashade Yemi Esan, who is the head of service of the Federation. Um, and yeah, so this you know, allows um, uh, f new fathers of newborns to bond uh, you know, over the course of uh, 14, 14 days. Um, I think as far as the um, maternity leave, we've got 98 countries around the world that comply with the, uh, the ILO, the International Labor Organization's guidelines for maternity leave, but only 78 countries or so uh, comply for paternity leave. And again, this is for um, uh, public sector workers uh, in Africa's largest uh, uh, economy. Um, another funding round news, we move to tech. Uh, Andela, which of course started off uh, in uh, Africa, uh, in Oboyeji who, of course, is uh, one of the who kickstarted and Della here in, in Nigeria. Um, they've re achieved unicorn status uh, based on a, f a Series E funding round led by SoftBank, uh, SoftBank's Vision Fund. SoftBank invested about led a $200 million round valuing Andela at $1.5 billion. So we've got another, another unicorn, and for our viewers, a unicorn is a, 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 a startup that is valued at least a billion dollars uh, or higher. Or higher. Um, 
And Dela, of course, um, they provide talent in uh, software engineering to tech companies around the world, allowing for these engineers to work uh, remotely. So it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's good for them. They say they're going to reinvest the funds that they get to make um, remote life easier for software engineers and also to uh, complete uh, expansion uh, around, uh, around the world. Um, finally, Cyril Ramaphosa uh, is saying that Africa is going to need, the sub-Saharan Africa is going to need about $240 billion uh, to, have, to have a complete clean energy shift. Um, he, he, I think he's attending, uh, South Africa will be at uh, uh, COP26 in November, uh, the climate initiatives. And, you know, he, again, he was talking to journalists in Johannesburg and saying that, hey, listen, you know, Africa is disproportionately affected by, by climate change. We're only responsible, the continent is only responsible for anywhere from just 3 to 5 percent of total carbon emissions. But the impact is disproportionate when you think about what it does to, you know, cause of drought and, and the impact, negative impacts on farmlands and so on and agriculture. So he's saying that for Africa to get in line um, as far as a clean energy transition is concerned, that's the amount of money that's going to be needed. There's still, of course, I mean, OPEC a day or two ago was still saying that fossil fuels are going to still, they're still going to be in demand for the foreseeable future. So there is, of course, going to be that pushback from, you know, um, oil and gas companies within uh, the African continent, especially the fossil fuel nations like Nigeria and others. That might push back a little bit on that, but generally, as far as the overall shift is concerned to, um, to more cleaner energy, Ram is saying $240 billion is what's needed. He's going to, they're going to need grants. They're going to need you know, support in that measure. Uh, and when you put that side by side with the impact that COVID has had on the budgets of several African countries, it's going to be challenging, right? Because, you know, the number of countries that African countries that just want to get their budgets in order. President Buhari was at the United Nations General Assembly talking about debt relief a few days after raising uh, $4 billion in a euro bond. But the issue is that for many of these countries, the issue is to get their budgets in line. Climate change may not be top priority right now, but Ramaphosa is pushing that, uh, pushing that forward. And that's our African business well, update for today. Two things. The first is about the 14-day paternity leave that uh, you know, civil servants in Nigeria can now have. I think that is an interesting development. There have been persons elsewhere in the world that have been pushing for it. And in the places where you have the best practices in the Scandinavia, countries like Sweden, Estonia, Lithuania, Hungary, and all that, you know, you can, sometimes in some of those countries, like Lithuania, you can take up to 156 weeks in a year. It's just that you get a certain percentage of your salary. The same in uh, Estonia, the same in Sweden, where, you know, our fathers are allowed to take time off to go and bond uh, with their parents. So here in Nigeria, it's good to see that men can also uh, go on a paternity leave to go and help change uh, their past. However, I think we need more details beyond being told that uh, public service rules have been changed, have been reviewed uh, to accommodate the interest of men. Uh, how many times can uh, a married man within the civil service in Nigeria, for example, take this paternity leave? Uh, you know, in our environment, in some cultural context, a man may have up to three, four wives. And all the four wives may put to bed the same year. <laughs> so will the civil servant be allowed to take the paternity leave uh, four times a year since, uh, you know, he has a commitment to every child within the spirit of the, of the law? And, uh, you know, all of that will need to be explained. And it, it will also probably have to be codified in those uh, public service rules. Unfortunately, many of our civil servants, they don't read the handbook anyway. They only remember the public service handbook when it is time for promotion exam. But I think with regard to paternity leave, we have to have that proper linkage between how many times you can go and uh, productivity. Otherwise, there are some people with five, six wives here in Nigeria. I'm not joking. I mean, I'm sure you know that it's the <laughs> truth. So they will just go on paternity leave and be collecting allowances I'm producing children on, a, on an annual basis, uh, you know, in a prolific manner. Anyway, that is that about that. I wanted to draw your attention to something. The Central Bank of Nigeria, and I don't know whether the, the story has been confirmed or not, has been taken to court by a com company called E-Naira Payment Solutions, which was incorporated in 2004. Over the use of the word uh, E-Naira uh, for the Central Bank uh, uh, Digital Currency uh, Program, and the matter is before the Federal High Court. Would that affect uh, the attempt by the uh, CBN to launch that uh, digital currency formally tomorrow to coincide with Nigeria's 61st uh, 
uh, Independence Anniversary? And has there been any reaction that you know of uh, from the central bank with regard to this uh, infringement on the copyright uh, case uh, and the cease and, uh, you know, restrain uh, order that that e-Naira payment solutions is seeking? Yeah, um, so the, the launch is now on the 4th. Uh, they've moved the launch to the 4th of October in order not to, uh, to, to clash with the Independence Day celebrations uh, tomorrow. Um, I haven't heard any reactions from the central bank, but um, this has been discussed. Uh, funny enough, uh, some folks in a, a tech WhatsApp group uh, that I'm in were talking about how they had friends in secondary school who were named e Naira uh, as a slang term. So I, I'm not really, I mean, as far the central bank is the regulator when it comes to legal tender in this country. The Naira has been uh, in circulation for as long as this country has been uh, using that tender. So, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I don't, you know, know how that's going to turn out. But I, I don't see that case going that far. I don't know what the legal term is for. Nothing is new under the sun, but there's something that just allows for coincidence. And I, I, wouldn't, I don't think that, e -Naira, that company has been in existence longer than the Naira has been established as legal tender in this country, and the central bank has been regulator in that regard. So I don't see that case going very far. But I haven't heard anything from the central bank at this point. Uh, and the official Naira, e Naira launch, again, is on the 4th of October. They've moved it back away from tomorrow's celebrations. Right, Rotus. So we keep talking about possibilities in Nigeria. And yesterday I talked about how much abundance we have, how much opportunity, but so much lack and so much waste. This Andela story corroborates it. Andela started with Inya Boyaji and a couple of other people a couple of years back. And they have grown the company to a unicorn today that is worth over a billion. The first major investment they got was from the Chan and Zuckerberg Foundation. And afterwards, they are getting this that pushes them from SoftBank, Mashir Sasson, into a billion. What are the possibilities? We keep talking about no Forex in this country, little or no dollars. The quickest way to get dollars is from a knowledge-based economy. And I'm going to put it to test for you. Andela trains software engineers. An average software engineer with one to two years of experience in America can make $95,000 a year. So just imagine if we train more software engineers in this country and we push them to do jobs for American companies, they could gain rough, roughly fifty dollars to $60,000 and it comes into this economy. If you have over five years experience as a software engineer, you could make as much as $124,000 US dollars. So just imagine we churn out more software engineers. I don't know the quarter Andela trains now. There are a lot of other people in this training software engineers. Very good friend of mine, Talent Q, former CEO, uh, uh, Adewale Yusuf, former CEO of TechPoints who started Talent Q, where they are training software engineers. If Nigeria and the federal government could ramp up training of software engineers and we get a quota of three to four million very top skilled software engineers in this country. Do you know how much that can push into this economy? Give or take, if we have software engineers that earn at least twenty to thirty thousand dollars a year, and we have two million of those people, you can do the maths and see how much influx right. will come into this economy. So the future of this country is not oil. Oil will not give you that money, but look at what software engineers alone from what they have upstairs and through training and expertise can give you. So I think it's incumbent on the government to support more Andelas, to build more Andelas, to build more software engineers that can do this work for companies abroad and bring that same money into our economy. This is another opportunity. I hope we see it. Another opportunity I present. When are we going to take it? I rest my case, Rotus. We'll move on well said. Well to, said. to business update with Michael Wilson, and he joins us from London. Great to have you. Good morning, Michael. Morning, Michael. Good morning.
morning. How are you? Sorry, I a little drop down on the line with all the things going on in this country. Unsurprising, basically. Anyway, the markets, first <laughs> of all. Overall, um, since we last spoke yesterday, it's been a bit of a choppy time, really. There's been a lot of things to think about. And so we'll go straight to Asia Pacific markets. And the big one there is a Chinese factory data uh, coming out relatively weak. Mainland Chinese stocks advanced, though. China's official manufacturing per PMI, Purchasers Managing ma uh, Managers Index, came in below 50, uh, not as expected. And that means a bit of a, a contraction. And also the continuing questions being asked about Evergrande and when it's actually going to repay its debt, if it will. And maybe the People's Bank of China China may step in. Who knows? A private sector, uh, a private survey on uh, on the fact factory activity in September came in though slightly above expectations. So. Um, what, what, what are we saying about China? I don't know. That's why the markets have been a bit choppy. Um, but it, it, this is certain. It's power crunch, which is going through right now. It's pushing foreign investors to look elsewhere. Um, in the last uh, seven days, many uh, local authorities and local governments in China have actually restricted power usage and so on. Um, and th obviously, the, the problem is that the, the central government, as well as dealing with it, wants to deal with uh, uh, reduce carbon emissions. So these foreign company investments worth millions of dollars, I don't know what the exact figure is, but it's quite considerable. Um, and wh whilst China is still seen as a very strong destination for, for foreign investment, uh, businesses are now looking to invest in, said, in Southeast Asia, particularly in Vietnam. We'll see about that. Meanwhile, uh, as far as the United States is concerned, let's recap there. U.S. stock futures higher, really, uh, very, very slightly. Tech decline um, because of worries about rising interest rates and so on. Move higher is pressuring tech stocks because, of course, it makes them less valuable and, and let their income less valuable. We'll move to Jay Powell, the chairman of the Fed, who calls inflation in the United States. He called it frustrating and sees it running into the next frustrated because the main economic policies are actually getting people to be vaccinated and that remains the most important economically we have. It's frustrating, he says, to see these bottlenecks in supply and um, interesting to see that it's happening in that country as well. And his future, uh, by no means certain, maybe he'll be replaced. Um, now, the House of Representatives in the United States passed a bill to suspend the US debt ceiling. Um, it's felt that that might work for a little while. That put a bit of a, a flip into the markets yesterday, but I th I'm thinking, and, and again, this is what the markets say, that the Republicans will eventually sink the plan uh, in the Senate. The, the, that Republican Party is opposed to any effort to raise the borrowing limit and appears intense on making Democrats address it as part of their sprawling investment. Um, and of course, we talked about this on the, on the program yesterday. Um, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen told lawmakers that the US will actually run out of money by October the 18th if the government government uh, doesn't solve its, its debt ceiling uh, problems. Um, in, in, let's move now to the e European Union. And um, given that recent uh, election in Germany, business is actually quite positive about um, a potential three-party coalition led by Olaf and um, The feeling is maybe that, that after years of what they, what they think in Germany has been stagnant investment, under Angela Merkel, uh, things may actually change for the better, a greener, more efficient economy, who knows. Um, UK, uh, green energy, despite the crisis, the fuel crisis, the energy crisis, which is just continuing, there are support, all courts are getting petrol, but we'll, we'll see about that. But what's, what's happening here is that some um, green energy surcharges, which there will be many, will go from electricity payers to gas as well shifting the tax burden to, to dirtier kinds of power, which um, gas is felt to be, whereas cleaner electricity will escape it. Big day today as far as the UK furlough scheme is concerned. It ends today. That helped 11.6 million workers after COVID for, for large parts of the, of the economy to actually close down. Um, it's end of July.
six million workers and whilst the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, is immensely proud of the 70 billion pound scheme, now is the right time to close it because of quite simply what he's pointing towards is that is the uh, millions of vacancies that there are uh, in this country at the moment um, as far as uh, distribution is concerned amazon is offering bonuses to attract 20,000 temporary staff to make sure that what is supposed to be delivered on christmas actually is um Amazon began by offering a, a £1,000 bonus for signing on permanent staff, but this temporary staff is actually quite, quite significant. Now, you were talking about oil. Um, Morgan Stanley says that as the oil price gets towards $80 a barrel, it's sending the markets towards what it, what it describes as demand destruction. Uh, with the winter ahead and the gas crunch in Europe, it means that uh, the demand picture looks promising. But as prices rise, and I keep saying this is only a commodity, it may be that um, exports are warning that, uh, that, that figures will be actually smaller. Of course, will increase inflation, which also poses a significant threat to demand. That's really to discuss, but that's what Morgan Stanley Finally, um, it continues its retreat, basically. Um, you know, again, not a lot of risk being seen right now. I actually don't agree with that, but I mean, this is what the gold market is actually doing. It's 1732 one dollars an ounce. Uh, and of course, it's the week long Chinese. Uh, holiday beginning uh, beginning tomorrow on Friday. So I think the markets are, are sort of girding their loins, particularly as far as Asia is concerned, uh, in the hope that uh, nothing will happen untoward whilst they're enjoying their, uh, their, their golden holiday. Right. That's the global view. All right, Michael, thank you so much for that insight. Two questions. Uh, Evergrande has started stripping their assets. It stripped one in a Chinese bank, flipped it over to get some cash outs. Uh, you talked about reactions. There's this story making the rounds about Credit Suisse being the bond issuer for Evergrande. How is that going to affect Credit Suisse and the European banking market? Because this has gone bust, no matter how the Chinese like to cover this up. It has gone bust already. They are flipping assets. Those bondholders will come in strong. Credit Suisse integrity is at stake. That's number one. Number two will be about the furlough scheme. Yes, it helped to keep those unemployment numbers down. It's finally ended now, but people still have residual cash and they are not gonna take up those vacancies in the UK. And apart from that, there's also something called national pride. I mean, we're complaining about driver's problem in the UK. It's because British people wouldn't step up and drive. Is it not little too soon? to pull that out, owing to the fact that initially, the UK is a very welfare I don't want to use the word nanny states. Isn't it going to backlash on the economy? Two questions. Okay, uh, furlough first. Um, I agree that uh, what, what the Chancellor is quite simply saying is, look, there are plenty of job vacancies around. It's time to get back to work. Whether people will or people won't, I don't know. I mean, the, the British are quite well known for being lazy as far as it's concerned. and, uh, and all those kind of jobs. As far as HGV drivers are concerned, I think that's a separate issue. It's the training that's difficult, and it's not a very attractive um, pr proposition. It's, pro it's, it's attractive for people maybe coming for a year and earning a lot of money and then going back, as they'll probably do that, or maybe even less. I don't think that the length of that uh, visa restriction lifting has actually been decided yet. I know what they're saying, but I think it will be extended long, long, long beyond Christmas. But that's really what the Chancellor is saying. He said, look, we supported you. It cost £70 billion to do it. Uh, we've done it now. Uh, and there are a lot of other sectors saying, well, we quite like this to continue, please, until the, the, the economy recovery gets back on its feet again. Um, so I think there's a, a lot of a lot of argument there uh, still to come. But I again, if you know, if I were the chancellor, I'd be saying, look, there is there is work out there. If you want to do it, it's completely up to you. We don't we're not an authoritarian state. We're a state full of people who don't necessarily want to work. Why would you want to work if you've been paid for staying at home? Um, and I, I think that the reality will start to bite just before. Christmas. As far as Evergrande's concerned, yeah, it could be. I mean, Credit Suisse, a lot of other banks as well are, are up um, in the way that finance 
the world. We just don't know what's happening there. I mean, everybody I speak to says, look, the Chinese government will find some way of actually disguising the reality as, as they always do. Maybe the People's Bank of China may set to prop it up. I mean, banks, uh, there was a recent, uh, well, I'm going to be talking about this Rotus actually on the on the Global Business Report about uh, a meeting between the, the the People's Bank of China and leading bankers saying it's about about time that banking uh, has actually set it set, setting this up supporting Evergrande property is about living in not about speculation well good luck with that I would say to them um, everybody else feels it's a a, a, mix, a mixture of the two so I think that yes you're absolutely right I think there's there's a lot more to come from Evergrande, and we certainly have not heard the last of the fact it's not repaid its bills. There's a long time to go before we, we start to, to get really concerned about it, but I'm worried right now, yeah. First of all, scheme. the Federation of Small Businesses is saying that, look, many small businesses will be affected and they still need more support. Yes, you cited that request for support, but I wanted your opinion, whether you think, you know, that will be something that uh, the Chancellor should consider, or whether indeed, you know, the uh, uh, plan for jobs, which is part of the uh, additional 400 billion package that the uh, chancellor announced before now, we take care of that. And to what extent should we expect redundancies uh, within the employment uh, unemployment market? And those small businesses in particular, travel market, animal air care, uh, that have stepped forward to complain uh, that the follow scheme shouldn't uh, just go like that. That's one. Two, France is accusing the United Kingdom of, uh, you know, uh, violating the agreements with regard to fishing rights. Both the French Minister of the Sea and the French Minister for Europe, they are threatening retaliatory actions. They even use the word collectively. Now, what kind of retaliation can that possibly be? And, uh, you know, what prospects do we face? Particularly now, that French boats uh, and their owners are by the island of Jersey in protest. And the British have had to deploy two naval ships uh, to just to serve as some kind of uh, uh, deterrence. And the main concern is that licenses that uh, the UK is expected to uh, approve uh, is rejected up to about three quarters of requests for licenses by French boats, uh, fr French fishing boats to fish in interna UK international waters as agreed. Jersey then. First of all, that's where it's going to be. If there's going to be any retaliatory action, it could be blockaded by the French. Um, this, this is an ongoing sore. For Jersey, what they're saying is their regulatory is saying we, we actually approved and, and, and disapproved um, of, of the license uh, the license requests according to the, the the individual cases so it's difficult it's difficult to know who's actually you know on, on the right side of this i suspect that jersey will continue to, to 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 regulate in the way that it has done already i think that fishing wars are very territorial and so on much bigger much more important to to brittany and the north of france than than they are to um the, the smaller smaller ports within the uk it's a big matter of national pride for france um, it's it's not so much a matter of national pride for the UK, very noisy for eternity, but as far as the economic, um, economic clout is concerned, not that much. I think, as I said before, when we talked about this all those months ago, you get a lot of posturing, uh, but, but not, not, not a lot of action. Uh, you know, the, 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 the French and the British, I mean, we had this business with the submarine and so on, didn't we? The submarines that were being made. And we were positing that maybe this was, the, you know, the end of the relation between France and the UK. It's not at all. Um, the, 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 the Five Eyes Security Alliance is just as strong as, as it always was, and I understand it. And whatever politicians do for their own benefit, whatever industries try to shout about and so on, disentangling that noise from what's actually going on is quite difficult, but I don't think a, a great deal will change. I think Jersey will speak up about and show what they actually decided and why they decided to do it. It's the sovereign sovereign part of the UK, and that's that, that's the French knew the regulations before they entered into it. As far as furlough is concerned, I think, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, there, there may be other there may be other ways of actually tapering the effect instead of this, like this cliff edge of, of stopping it. But there has been plenty of warning that this would be as far as it would go. And it's not an open it's not an open checkbook. I, I'm not supporting it or, 
or attacking it. I'm just saying that, that that's an absolute fact of life. I think if things can be made easier for particular sectors like the service sector, I mean, they're also facing an increase in value added tax as well, aren't they? As a result of uh, a result of the, the the pandemic relief fund being being uh, being wound down. So I think there's a there's there's a lot of um, I, I can't really answer your question directly. All I can say is I think we're in for a lot of discussion about this. All right, Thank feels, you, Michael. Feels like jumping off a running treadmill, honestly, with, with this quick pull the plug thing. But thank you so much, Michael. Really appreciate you. For update on COVID-19 pandemic, Adesua Morwa joins us. Adesua, great to have you. Birthday girl, don't forget our implications. Hi, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> I won't forget. Good morning, Dr. Abatsi. And we miss Tundun this morning on set. Uh, but let's take a look at the latest figures from the, um, global pan the, from the pandemic, which is global, by the way. Uh, COVID-19 has infected more than 233 million people, according to the Johns Hopkins University, and over 4.7 million uh, of those infected have now died from the virus. Uh, however, COVID-19 restrictions and, uh, are being eased in many parts of the world, but it's not total freedom as vaccine passports or certificates and mandates are coming into place in many of these places. One of America's largest airlines, United Airlines, is set to fire nearly 600 of its staff for failing to comply, comply with its vaccine mandate. But so far, over 6.2 billion doses of vaccines have been administered globally. Uh, China, where the virus was, was first detected or first emerged in 2019, yesterday said it has now fully vaccinated 1.05 billion of its population. Here in Nigeria, 437 cases and six deaths were reported from 17 states and the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja, according to the NCDC. But they are not all new cases. Uh, there's a backlog from the epicenter, Lagos, as well as the southeastern state of Anambra. Uh, so we're seeing reporting from some states, backlog of deaths, of cases coming in, but they are reporting them. Meanwhile, there has been no data released by the vaccination agency in Nigeria for the last 24-hour period. However, this is where the country stands. If you have those figures on your screen now, over 4.7 million people in Nigeria targeted for vaccination have received a dose of the available jabs and almost 2 million others have had their second jab. So 1.9, about 1.9 million Nigerians have now been fully vaccinated in the targeted population. Nigeria is targeting 70% of its population to be vaccinated against the COVID-19. And uh, some good news. Uh, yesterday, we raised a lot of questions. Where's Nigeria during this pandemic? Have we learned any lessons? I, I think this is a testament that we do have what it takes. Perhaps what we don't have is the will to get it done. The World Health Organization yesterday appointed a professor of virology, someone we know very well on the Arise News channel, Professor Oyewale Tomori, to serve as a member of his technical advisory group on COVID-19 vaccine composition. The WHO uh, made this known uh, during, uh, through a statement yesterday, it says the former vice chancellor of the Redeemers University uh, has been appointed to that role. The technical advisory group on COVID-19 vaccine composition is actually an independent group of experts that would periodically review the evidence and analyze the implications of em emerging variants of concerns on the performance of the COVID-19 vaccines that are available. His appointment comes just weeks after the World Health Body also appointed another Nigerian, the outgoing boss of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, NCDC, Dr. Chike Ihe Kwazu. Uh, he was appointed as the Assistant Director General of the Health Emergency Intelligence in Berlin. Away from Nigeria, a former South African health minister, Dr. Israeli Mehize, has been indicted in a corruption scandal involving the awarding of a COVID-19 communications contract. A probe by the country's special investigating unit found him guilty of what they call a distinct lack of oversight over the contract worth around $10 million. 
This money was meant to aid the fight against COVID-19, especially in the area of communication strategy for South Africa. Uh, Dr. Mikize, who stepped down in August, is denying any wrongdoing. And finally, it's been described as a major crackdown on COVID-19 misinformation and other diseases. YouTube has announced it would remove videos and some high-profile users that falsely claim approved vaccines are dangerous. The video sharing giant uh, has already banned posts that spread falsehood around coronavirus treatments, including ones that share inaccurate claims about vaccines shown to be safe. Well, we've continued to insist that uh, high-tech companies should join uh, other stakeholders in the world uh, to ensure that the world remains safe for everyone, whether it is with regard to, uh, you know, violence being uh, promoted or hate speech. And in this particular instance, one major challenge that we have faced with the COVID-19 pandemic is the threat of infodemic. Now, YouTube, owned by Google, has come forward to do this, and I think that that's consistent. Uh, with the expectations of the international community, because anti-vaxxers running various platforms, not just on YouTube, elsewhere, on social media, have done uh, incalculable damage into promoting, in terms of promoting vaccine hesitancy and slowing down uh, the uh, vaccination rate uh, worldwide. Now, what uh, YouTube is saying this time around is that it's not just with regard to the COVID uh, uh, vaccine. Any vaccine at all that has been approved, uh, for use, whether it has to do with measles or it has to do with uh, lupus or any other kind of ailment, you know, the recognition is that misinformation can cause more danger than even the pandemic itself. And in the last one year, YouTube has had cost to remove over 1 million videos from its site. With regard to COVID-19, a total of 130,000 uh, videos have been removed within the course of this year alone. However, there is a, an imagined political dimension to it. Russia is kicking. Russia says two German language uh, sites that is backed by, uh, by the state, by Russia, you know, have been removed. And in the view of uh, Moscow, uh, this amounts to censorship. And the Russian authorities are not just threatening, uh, you know, to uh, retaliate against uh, YouTube. They are also accusing the German government, Germany, of being behind it. They say this is, uh, this is what they call uh, Operation Information Operation Media Barbarossa, which is a throwback to the 1941 uh, invasion of Russia by the Nazi uh, forces, you know. And so there's an international dimension to it. Will YouTube, would they blink? Uh, would they feel intimidated by, uh, by uh, Russia saying that this is a clear case of Russophobia uh, sponsored and uh, promoted by both the United States and, uh, and uh, Germany? Now, as for Professor uh, Yowali Tomori, yes, congratulations to him. I mean, you, you know, it's not unexpected. He's a very distinguished man in his profession. And it proves that point again about how we have so many good talents in Nigeria. And, uh, you know, in, in the space of one month, we have had Dr. Ye Kwazu, uh, who is going to assume duties on November 1. And now Professor Yowali Tomori, who, in fact, you know, is associated with the Ministry of Health in Nigeria, in a similar capacity, in an advisory capacity. Finally, corruption and COVID-19. You cited the example of uh, uh, Dr. Nkize uh, of, uh, of uh, South Africa. Well, it's not just that he didn't uh, exercise oversight functions. It's that the money that was taken, that was diverted, was used to renovate his building, was used to buy a car for his son, was used to pay his bills. But what the Special Intelligence Unit is saying is that for him, although he may have been indicted, for him to be prosecuted, uh, President Ramaphosa must take executive action. We hope he will do so, because one of the major threats to pandemics, to emergencies, is corruption, lack of transparency, opaqueness in the procurement process. As we have seen in the case of uh, former Minister Moyo in uh, Zimbabwe, the minister in uh, Zimbabwe, you know, went through a procurement process with a company called Dras Consult. Now, in June, July, he was, in fact, taken to court. And then another example would be uh, in the UK, Matt Hancock, as health secretary. There was a high court ruling that, you know, the rule requiring him to report contracts that have been entered into within 30 days, that he flouted that reg regulation. So the problem with emergencies is that because it's an emergency, you know, uh, the authorities or certain officials, they, then to, they tend to bypass uh, due process, 
because they need to act very quickly in the case of in the face of a public health crisis. So the lesson, you know, is that countries have to develop stronger transparency and accountability processes. They have to put in place mechanisms that cannot be compromised, uh, you know, in the face of a public health uh, emergency. But we hope that uh, President Ramaphosa will ensure that Dr. Nkize, who has gone from being a hero in terms of managing COVID, now has his uh, uh, reputation in a very difficult place, that the president would, uh, uh, you know, live up to his uh, commitment, his uh, protestations and affirmations that his uh, administration has zero tolerance uh, for corruption, whether it's within the party or within the government. I think one thing that lingers after COVID-19 will be, you know, showing who human beings truly are for what they are. The corruption, the stealing that happened of vaccines, people trying to sell vaccines on the dark web, fake vaccines, people trying to do all sorts, the infodemic, the shenanigan in general, the, the, the madness of some world leaders. You know, some countries have not even gotten one vaccine to take. Some are already taking three, even booster jabs. The fact that social media and the media in general is not to be blamed. They are just platforms that enunciate the madness that goes on in the human mind sometimes. I think that's one thing we're learning really from this pandemic. The fact that this word of global solidarity truly needs to be reviewed. The fact that some people don't care, they, they can prefer to kill people just to get their political gains like we saw in India, you know, Go ahead with the Kumala Festival so that religious adherents can vote for you in the election while there was a pandemic. And they don't care about it. Rich nations, poor nations, poor nations have their problems. Rich nations, they use all the money to buy excess vaccines and they, they, they prefer to waste it. Poor nations, the little ones they get, they prefer to fritter out away corruption. So I think it just shows who human beings truly are. But one thing is certain, it is best we come together and learn because disease will not leave the world. It is coronavirus today. What will be the next big pandemic in the world? And are we ready? And if we don't settle all these problems of what lies within us as human beings and get better in our relationship and our true love for one another, then the next pandemic might be more disastrous than this pandemic. I hope we listen. I hope we learn. Thank you so much, Adesu, as always. And don't forget the implications. Thank you.